subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. It's the SHSR, and I welcome you all. My name is Sir Walter. We are going to treat economics, and under this subject, we'll be focusing our attention on factors of production. So far, so good. We've gone through the meaning of economics. We've done the scope of economics. Then we also did some basic concepts of economics. We want to progress to factors of production. I hope our previous lessons have been useful to you. As we do in economics, we hold all other factors constant. If we are talking about all the other factors, we are looking at your phones, we are looking at your laptops, we are looking at any other thing that will distract you. All right? We hold all of them constant and we give our maximum attention to this particular topic. Yet an interesting topic. Yes. I hope now you've settled and you've made up your mind that you'll be an economist in future. So I want to refer to you as economist. Yeah, that's a prestigious title. All right, so let's start. Factors of production. Factors of production. By the end of this lesson, I will expect you, the student, to be able to define the term factors of production. You should also be able to define and explain the characteristics of land. You should be able to explain also and define the characteristics of capital. You should be able to define and explain characteristics of labor. And lastly, define and explain characteristics of entrepreneur. So what is factors of production? The term factors of production. They are resources used for the production of goods and services. They are resources used for the production of goods and services. If you can recall, we've talked about means in our previous lessons, where we said means are resources to satisfy our wants. To a very large extent, these means are termed factors of production. So we are going to delve into the factors of production. We are going to delve into what we use to produce goods and services that we see in various shops, in various outlets that we buy to satisfy our wants. Yes, we put them under resources. Now think about anything we use for the production of goods. I just want you to think about them. Anything we use for the production of goods. All right. I'm sure what we are going to talk about will just match up to whatever you were thinking about. When we talk of resources, they could be natural in nature. I'm sure some of the things you were thinking about that we use for production is natural. We're thinking of some raw materials. I know many of you like chocolate. What do we use to produce chocolate? It's the cocoa bean. How do we get a cocoa bean? From natural source. I hope you get it. So cocoa bean becomes a resource for the production of chocolate and it is natural. All right. Good. Some of the resources are man-made. All right. So let's take cars, for instance. We use cars to provide transportation service. And these cars that are the resources for the provision of transportation service are made by man. Mm -hmm. So some of the resources are man-made. Also, ourselves as human beings, we are resource. 
or there is some part of us, some portion of us that are considered as, as resource. I'm being a resourceful person to you today as we are going through economic how I am leading you to understand certain concepts in economics. So I'm offering some kind of service to you. And that service I'm offering to you is, is, is resource in nature. So that resource is a human resource I'm talking about. Of course. You notice that anything we produce, anything we produce, Aside the fact that it will be man-made or natural, it will take the labor to also edit the good and service to be realized. Yeah. So we say the resource can be human. Now, we have the human resource, we have the man-made resource, we have the natural resources. All these resources need some management. We need to manage them. So we have the managerial aspect of resources. So the act of managing these resources we've talked about is also in itself a resource. I hope that is clear. So we've made up the point that resources can be natural, it can be man-made, it can be human, it can be managerial. Now, in economics, when we talk about a natural resource, it is termed land. In economics, the natural resource is termed land. So, in any economics class, when we talk about land, it goes beyond the bare land we see. It will be any natural resource. Yes. Subsequently, we'll be talking about land in isolation. We'll talk about all the various factors of production in isolation, and you would understand better. All right? Man-made resources in economics are known as capital. Human resources in economics, known as labor. Yes, then again, when we talk of capital, I'm sure by now you've heard capital, 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 maybe capital for work, capital for that. And our minds are always on the fact that people are receiving money to go and do business, people are receiving this kind of loan to go and do business, and we are calling it capital. But it goes beyond that, yes. Then again, when we discuss capital into details, you will notice that it is not just the capital we are using to work. It goes beyond that. Then we have the labor. We've also heard the word labor. When we say labor, we are always thinking of, we are always thinking of people doing miniature jobs, sort of. Oh, this person is a laborer. This person is a laborer. But anybody who is offering human resource in economics is classified as labor. All right? Good. Then we have the last one, managerial resource. In economics, all the managerial resource will be termed entrepreneur. So if you are an entrepreneur, it means you are managing labor, you are managing capital, you are managing land. Yes. I hope that is clear with you. With you. All right. So by way of summarizing whatever we want to do today, we are saying that resources are what is used or resources used for the production of goods and services are classified factors of production. And these factors of production can be natural. And in economics, natural resources are known as land. It could be man-made. And the man resources in economics are known as capital. It could be human in nature. And the human resources in economics are classified as what? Labor. And lastly, these resources that we've mentioned, that's the man-made, natural, and human resource, are managed to bring out the desired output. And that managerial aspect the managerial service to these resources is also a resource and that in economics named entrepreneur. Yeah. Clear the confusion. Good. So let's make heavy. 
who pick land as a factor of production about it land as a factor of production as i told you earlier on land is not just the land it goes beyond that in economics so then let's talk about land land are all natural resources on or beneath the surface of the earth used to produce goods and services so all natural resources on the surface or beneath the earth used for the production of goods and services is land that is land yes in economics of course so let's look at some examples obviously we'll talk about the bare land but beyond the bare land that we know we can talk about water bodies you know the water bodies we have around are also used for the production of goods and services fishing fish production is done in the various water bodies in a way so the water bodies are natural resource they are termed land we can talk about sunshine we get some energy from the sun yes solar energy you learned it in science right and you know that it is a particular venture of electricity that is really growing we now have solar lamps we have solar um solar calculators even the calculators we use we have the solar bit of it some houses some few houses are using the solar panels yes how are these energies generated they are generated from the raw material sunshine so that is also land mineral deposit is also land mineral deposit is land we talk of the gold the bauxite the magnesium whatever mineral deposit is land yes i hope that understanding is clear good so let us look at the characteristics of land the characteristics of land the first one i want us to talk about with no particular order is the fact that they are free gift of nature land as a factor of production comes from nature it means that no man did nothing to bring it into existence we don't do anything as men to bring it into existence its existence doesn't depend on man we came to meet trees we came to meet water bodies i mean nobody created the sea of course people try to create dams but the created dams are created out of water bodies that existed or they use water that existed to create it right so the water bodies we see around a lot of them they are land yes think of the water bodies in your in your region in your country yeah they are land okay so let's move on to the second point land is geographically immobile but occupationally mobile land is geographically immobile but occupationally mobile this particular feature of land is directly focused on the bare land itself right so what it means is that geographically you cannot move land from one place to another for example if you are in city a and you come from city b where you have lots of land there you want to move them to city a it wouldn't be possible nobody has been able to move land from one place to another yes so that explains the fact that land is geographically immobile but when we talk about land being occupationally mobile it means that we can use a particular land for different purposes so if you have a land you can use it for farming that is one option of it you can build a house on it you can use it or you can give it up 
for it to be used as a road. Think about other things you can do with the land. So different purposes that can be used on the land express the fact that land is occupationally immobile. I hope that is clear. All right. Occupationally mobile. Yes, mobile. So it expresses the fact that land is occupationally mobile. I hope that is clear. Okay. Now let's move on to the next one. Land is fixed in quantity. Land is fixed in quantity. In other words, we can say the supply of land is fixed. We are looking at land in totality. You know that with all the scientific knowledge and technology we have, we've not been able to create land. We've not been able to create land to add to the existing land in the world. Sometimes technology tries to improve land supply in a given area by reclaiming land from the sea. But the actual effect is that if you reclaim land from the sea at a particular point, the sea moves to cover another land at a different point. So land in total, land in total is fixed as the quantity. We cannot add, uh, we cannot add anything to the quantity as far as the supply of land is concerned. Then to the next point. Land differ in value and quantity. Land differ in value and quantity. Take a plot of land, for example. The value, yes, quality. Oh, sorry. Okay. Land differ in value and quality. In value and quality. Now, when we say land differ in value, it means that the amount we pay for a given land area is not the same everywhere. Take a plot of land, for example. You would buy it in city A at a particular amount. When you go to city B, that same plot of land will differ in value. It will not be the same amount. So when we say land differ in value, this is what it means. And also the value in another way. Some lands are in the desert areas. Some lands are also found in the forest areas so if you look at the beauty of land you would note that they vary and for that matter you can say the value in terms of beauty of the land varies now let's go to quality of land when we talk of quality of land we are looking at productivity of land land productivity differ from place to place you can have a particular country let's say Ghana productivity of land in the southern part of Ghana is not the same as the productivity of land in the northern part of Ghana to a very large extent productivity in the southern part of Ghana is higher than productivity in the northern part of Ghana so the quality of land differ they are not the same yeah so let's move on to the next point. Land does not act on its own initiative. Land does not act on its own initiative. When we say land does not act on its own initiative, in other words, we are trying to say land is a passive factor. Land is a passive factor. To be able to put land to use, it needs labor. It needs capital. 
it needs the managerial skill that's the entrepreneur land cannot just produce on its own so if you want land to do something let's say you want land productivity for a particular commodity you would have to employ the services of labor to see to it that land will produce that particular commodity yeah how that is clear then the last one on the slide the reward for land are rent and royalties that is for the usage of land we get a reward rent or royalty there is this common question in objectives as far as examinations are concerned be it wasi end of semester exam they could just ask you what is the reward for land then they just put the answers there you should note that it will be rent and royalties rent and royalties good so let's move on to talk about some importance of land how is land useful to us it is a source of raw materials for production think about the raw materials especially in the agro based industries most of the raw materials if not all are derived from land take a juice factory they make their juice or drinks from raw materials like fruits and fruits are gotten directly from land they are um, they are natural of course think of the food processing industries example like the tin tomato we process the tomato and can them put them into tins and the tomato is gotten directly from land so many raw materials that we have are derived from land then we move on to the next one it provides means of transport what are the means of transport available to us now yes we can talk of road rail by water it can also be air so when we talk of these means of transport they are all natural yes by road we mean we are using the bare land itself by water it means we are using water bodies and those are also example of land by air it is still natural even with rail although the rail lines are man made it is on the land without the land that transportation by rail will not be possible i hope that is clear the next one it gives employment it gives employment look at the people in the extraction industry very numerous in the extraction industry there are numerous people there talk of miners we have a lot of people in mining we talk of the quarrying business a lot of people are there even in tree cutting a lot of people who are doing lumbering a lot of people are into crop production a lot of people are into animal rearing most of these activities are directly linked to land this is providing employment for a lot and lot and lot of people yeah so the next one is that land generates foreign exchange most of these raw materials that we derive from land are exported to other countries for foreign exchange we export these raw materials that are even classified as land to other countries and we get foreign exchange then the next one it provides space for infrastructural development think of the high-rise buildings that make many countries beautiful 
Where would you put them if not on the land? You will not be able to put them in the air. We cannot build castles in the air. We cannot build infrastructure in the air. We cannot build roads in the air. Land will provide us with a space to do so. So land provides us with space. I mean, infrastructure would not even be possible without land. So going through this, we see that land is very important. Land as a factor of production is very, very, very important. Yeah. Now let's move on. Factors affecting productivity of land. Factors affecting productivity of land. We expect land to give us lots and lots and lots of goods and services to provide us with lots of services that will help us promote our welfare. But there are certain mitigating factors that will affect the productivity of land. One of it is weather. Obvious. Weather is very, very obvious. So weather affects productivity of land a lot. When you come to countries that are closer to the equator, where most of the time they have the rainy season and the dry season, most farmers there are relying on the rains to come so that they can produce more crops. Yes, so when the rain is setting, more crops are produced. Yes, if you go to the template regions, those who are farther away from the equator, they are talking about the Europe, the America, and, and what have you. Those people also farm. They have other technologies that they are using, the greenhouse and other technologies they use to farm. But even with that, the weather is a challenge. If it snows too much, and the snow is covering the various lands, it wouldn't be a very good situation to do farming. So the weather is key as far as productivity of land is concerned. Another mitigating factor on the productivity of land is land fertility. Land fertility. If you have a land that cannot produce crops, that cannot produce goods, then that land is useless in a way. So, we know very well that fertility of land is temporary. Because fertility of land is temporal, that is, if you cultivate land, we've learned from our Greek in JHS that if you cultivate land for a very long time, it loses its fertility. So, if land is losing its fertility, it directly affects the productivity of it. So the fertility of land is a problem, much of a problem. Then land ownership laws. Land ownership laws. You see, the ownership of land is also posing productivity on land. To the extent that there are so many lands with litigations especially in hotspot areas. There are so many lands that are left bare. They are not using it to produce anything. They are not using it to cultivate crops. They are not building any, any structures on them just because those lands are under litigation. This person says, I own it, this person says, I own it. And because it is in court, that land will not be available for development in a way. Sometimes people would want to develop land, but others will oppose them because the ownership is not really clear. To the point that people put up structures and those structures would have to be destroyed just because of land ownership problems. Yeah. Then technology also affects land. To a large extent, technology affects productivity of land in a positive manner. Yes, there are lots of technologies that we use or that we see around that is boosting productivity of land. Yes, when we use mechanized farming, it is going to boost productivity of crops that we produce. 
Look at the technology that is used to build high-rise buildings. In some times past, you can have a plot of land, and that land is, is used to build a maximum four-bedroom or five-bedroom house. But today, due to technology, that same land can produce more than enough apartments. Yes, due to technology, you build high-rise buildings and it gives enough apartments. Then the last one, government policy. Government policy. If government gives policies that create a enabling environment for productivity of land to manifest itself in a positive way, then it will do so. If government gives out credit facilities with lower interest, if government gives out incentives to developers of land, to farmers, to whoever is affecting the productivity of land, land is going to be very productive. If government himself also put up certain policies that will involve the government directly into productivity of land, it is also going to affect productivity of land in a positive way. Otherwise, it will take a downturn. I hope this has been helpful. Now let's move on to capital as another factor of production. Capital is a man-made resource used to produce goods and service. So think about all these resources used to produce goods and services that were made by man. Example would be machinery, buildings, vehicles. These are resources used or made by man used for the production of goods and services and they are termed capital good so let's look at the characteristics of capital capital is man-made as we already talked about that means man brought it to existence it can be fixed or circulating it can be fixed or circulating. When we say capital is fixed, it means that in the course of production, capital does not change its form. Capital is fixed because in the course of production, it does not change its form. For example, in your various schools, the school building has been used to produce students, to produce education service and it has never changed it's still the same over the years so that is a typical example of a fixed capital now let's talk about circulating capital circulating capital on the other hand it is capital that changes its form in the course of production circulating capital changes its form in the course of production example is flour flour is used to make bread Flour is made from wheat. When you make the flour and you use it to make the bread, in the course of making the bread, the flour will transform into the bread. So that makes the flour a circulating capital. Yes, I hope you get it. Good. Now let's talk about the next one. It cannot act on its own initiative. So capital is also a passive factor, meaning without a human touch capital cannot work without somebody controlling a machine the machine will not be able to work that is why we say capital is a passive factor or it cannot act on its own initiative how that is clear now the next one as for capital it is both geographical and occupational mobile. So capital is geographically and occupationally mobile, meaning to a large extent, you can move machines from one place to another. Yes, I'm using to a large extent because there could be exceptions. Yes, you cannot move a high rise building from one place to another. Yes, I agree. But to a large extent, many of the machines and equipment tools that we use 
you can move them from one place to another. So we say to a large extent, capital is geographically mobile. And when we say capital is occupationally mobile, it means with a particular machine, you can use it for several purposes. You can use it for several purposes. That makes it occupationally mobile too. Capital depreciates. Yeah. If you have a machine in January, by the time it gets to December, it will not be the same. Yes. Look at the tables and chairs or the desk you use in your schools. Some of you might have gone to meet very new chairs and tables in school when you were in form GHS 1. But by the time you be leaving GHS 3, those chairs will not be as new as the time you were in GHS 1. Yeah. So what has happened there is depreciation. The value decreases in a way. That machine or that tool go through what is called the wear and tear. That means it has depreciated. Good. Then Capital is temporary in nature. When we say capital is temporary in nature, it means that capital will not exist forever. Even buildings. Yes, are you aware buildings have their expiry date, if you like? Yes, if you put up a building for some number of years, yes, it takes a very long time. Buildings become weak and you have to break them and build new ones. That's how it is. So capital is temporary in nature. Then the last one is the reward for the usage of capital is interest. So take note of the last one. The reward for capital is interest. So when you use capital, you get interest. Now let's move on to forms of capital. We have fixed capital, circulating capital, social capital, real capital. Now take note, you could find other types or forms of capital in books, but these are the most important ones. Wayek approved ones. Why am I saying they are the Wayek approved ones? You can make reference to Wasi 2020. No, Wasi 2019. Yes, WASI 2019. Make reference to WASI 2019. There was this question which stated that what are the what are the forms of capital available to the entrepreneur or to a businessman? They were so specific, and these were the capital forms of capital mentioned. So the other ones, I'm not saying are not important, but to a large extent, state these forms of capital for the purpose of exam. Good. So we've already talked about what fixed capital is, where we said it doesn't change its form in the course of production, and circulating capital changes its form in the course of production. Good. Now let's talk about social capital. Social capital, it is the capital owned by the society. When we say capital is owned by the society, everybody uses it in a way. It is for the society. Community library is a social capital. Good. Then we have real capital. Real capital describes all man-made resources that exist at a particular point in time. So real capital, to a large extent, describes capital in general. Good. Now to the next one. Differences between wealth and capital. It is worthy to note the difference between wealth and capital because it has been a past question before. Now wealth is the stock of goods that exist at a particular time. Wealth, the stock of goods that exist at a particular time. But when we talk of capital, it will be that wealth which is used for further production. So if you have a man-made resource that exists at a particular time, it is wealth. The very moment you use it for further production, it becomes capital. So for example, 
when you buy a car for personal use, it is your wealth. But if you decide to use the car as a taxi or for commercial purpose, it becomes a capital. So note that capital is wealth used for further production. Yeah. Then we move on to the sources of capital to an entrepreneur. If you're an entrepreneur, you want to start a business, what are some of the sources of capital? We will categorize these sources of capital into two. We have the internal source and we have the external source. So under the internal source of capital, we have personal savings. Of course, you might have put some money aside over the years, over a period of time. That is the personal savings. You can draw from that money to start your business or to revamp your business or to get your business going. You can also get it from loans. Yes, we go to banks, other financial institutions, and we draw money. Then we have bank overdraft. When we talk about bank overdraft, that is when you go to the bank or the financial institution to redraw amount of money higher than what you have in your account. So for instance, if you have 200 Ghana cities in your account and you apply for overdraft of 400 Ghana cities or you want to withdraw 400 cities, you can do so by applying for an overdraft. By so doing, you'll be withdrawing money which is more than what is in your account. Good. Then we have the plowback profit. So whatever money that you get as profit as an entrepreneur, you can decide to spend it or push it back into the business. So if you are plowing back the profit into the business, it is also a source of capital. Then the sale of shares. Many businesses, especially those who have registered their businesses with the Ghana Stock Exchange, are able to raise money through the sale of shares. They float shares. Shares represent ownership of the business. They floated by so doing. People will buy and they automatically become part owners of the business. And when they buy, it is a way of raising money by the company. Yeah. So let us look at the external sources. Loans can also be drawn from external sources. We can go to the international financial agencies for loans. Then we also talk about direct investment. Foreign companies come to do business in Ghana and it's also a source of income for us in a way. If it is business, there are foreign businesses that come to the country to partner with other people by way of giving them resources to run businesses. And it does well a lot. There are lots of businesses in Ghana that will have their mother business in other countries. And those businesses are doing so well to a large extent because of the fact that there has been that direct investment. And we also have grants. Of course, there are monies we receive from some international benevolent countries. Good. So, we move on to importance of capital. When we talk of the importance of capital, it is essential for production. Think of all the production we do. Many of them, or most of them, I dare to say, use capital. Yes. So, as I'm teaching you, you are using a device, which is your television, which is your satellite or your digibox to assess this kind of teaching. That television or digibox you are using there is capital. Without it, how would you be able to get to me? So capital is very essential in production. Yeah. It, is, it, is, it increases productivity. Anytime we want to increase productivity, it is enhanced by technology. And technology, to a large extent, is capital. Technology to a large extent is capital. So capital helps to boost productivity. 
Then also it creates employment. It creates lots of employment. Yes. Before this education service will get to you, there are lots of things involved. Somebody would have to operate the camera. Somebody would have to direct. There will be a sound person. You know, there will be other backroom staff. We need all these people to make this work. And it is by way creating employment. Yeah, it is creating employment. You know, capital is a passive factor. And for that matter, it needs someone. It needs a human being to operate it. So whenever we create a capital, automatically we create an employment for someone. Yeah. Then lastly, devices for transportation are derived from capital. We use cars, we use trains, we use aircraft. All these are man-made. They are classified as capital. You see, capital is very, very important. Huh. That's good. So let us talk about labor as another factor of production. So labor is both physical and mental effort, which is used to produce goods and services. Now, it is worthy to note that labor is classified into three. We have the skilled, unskilled, and the semi-skilled. The skilled labor use more of the physical, the skilled labor use more of the mental effort than the physical effort. Whilst unskilled labor use more of the physical effort than the mental effort. When we talk of the semi-skilled, they are people which have taken some form of training, but not really advanced or not really a specialized training, but they have some form of training. Now, there is no clear-cut jobs for the various categories, because if you even take carpentry, we have a very skilled carpenter. We have a semi-skilled carpenter and an unskilled carpenter. I hope you get it. But some jobs to a large extent are skilled jobs, like teaching or being a lawyer and what have you. All right? So let us look at the characteristics of labor. And this recent WASI, there was a question like that. Characteristics of labor. Labor is a human factor, as we've already talked about. Labor is an active factor. That labor can act on its own initiative. All right? Then labor can be skilled, semi-skilled, or unskilled. I just talked about that. Then labor controls and combines the other factors of production. You remember? Yes. Then labor is perishable. Labor is perishable. Then also, the reward for labor is wages and salary. So when people work, at the end of the day, they go for their salaries. Good. Now, let's move on to entrepreneur. I told you that all these factors of production are managed by a particular person known as the entrepreneur. So entrepreneur is somebody who combines the factors of production in their right proportion to produce goods and services. And in addition, best risk associated with the business. The entrepreneur best risk associated with the business. Now let's quickly look at some functions of this entrepreneur. He makes decisions concerning the business. He bears risk associated with the business. He is the one who provides capital for the running of the business. And he manages the business. So that's what an entrepreneur does. So the entrepreneur is the manager, or to a large extent, the owner of the business. Good. Now, let's do some, let us do recap on what we've done so far. We said we have factors of production, which are resources used for the production of goods and services. We made mention of the fact that these resources could be natural, and in economics, they are termed land. It could be man-made, in economics, they are termed capital. It could be human, in economics, they are termed labor. And we need a particular resource to manage these factors of production. That's a managerial aspect, and that is known as the entrepreneur. Yeah, I hope it has gone down well with you. 
Now let's look at these questions to see if we really got what we said. Distinguish between labor and entrepreneur. Yeah. This one, you can say that labor coordinates the other factors, but entrepreneur manage all of them, including labor. So labor will be human effort. Entrepreneur is also human effort, but entrepreneur takes the managerial aspect of it, whilst labor will take the subordinate aspect of the work. In what ways can we improve productivity of land? You see, we talked about it. If the weather is not helping, we can use mechanized farming, irrigation, and what have you. Right? Yes, I want you to be thinking about some answers. Yes, I hope you are getting them from the problems we, we talked about. We have to improve our land ownership systems so that land will be available for development. Now, we are also supposed to suggest three factors to improve entrepreneurship in West Africa. Now, you bear with me that businesses come, but they don't last, especially one-man businesses. You will see a business, it will be flamboyant. For like five years after that, it is collapsing. What are some of the reasons? And what are some of the suggestions we put in place to solve these? There should be availability of credit facilities. Government should create a neighboring environment right small taxes should be apportioned to infant businesses businesses that are starting or businesses that are in the beginning stages businesses that are struggling these are some of the things government should do to support the business yes the businesses should be structured well we should rather be thinking of more of partnership business than one man business so that in the situation where the owner dies there are other partners who can continue the business. Then characteristics of labor. We just talked about them. All right. Characteristics of labor. We just talked about labor. So what do you think are some of the characteristics of labor? Labor is a human factor. Labor is perishable. Think of that. That is, if you were supposed to do something, you were supposed to work in a particular time, and the time passes and you don't work, you lose that time. You lose that service. So labor is perishable. For instance, if you joined halfway through the lesson, you will lose what we did initially. Right? Labor can be skilled or unskilled or semi-skilled based on the training available. These are some characteristics of labor. You can get more characteristics of labor when you go through the recent WASI examination scheme. Yeah, it's available in textbooks and you get the answers there. I hope this class has been a very fruitful one. Yes. And I would urge you to do some more reading on this topic so that you don't forget. My name is Sir Walter and thank you for staying with me. Till we meet again next time, it's a bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.